water. Clean, fresh drinking water. It's a fundamental necessity of life for all of us. We get fresh water from many sources, lakes, rivers, and from underground sources as well. In fact, almost half the population of the United States gets its drinking water from underground sources. Naturally, maintaining and protecting the quality of these underground sources of drinking water is of great importance to federal, state, and local governments, as well as industries, businesses, and ultimately individuals like you and me. Hello, I'm Quinn Matthews. In this program, we're going to take a look at the extensive efforts of an industry dedicated to protecting the quality of these freshwater sources, the oil and gas industry. Some of you may be unaware that underground injection wells play an increasingly important role in the oil and gas industry. This increased role is because most oil wells produce salty water along with oil and gas. Somehow this salt water must be continuously used to increase oil production or be disposed of. There have been many methods of disposal employed over the years, but currently the vast majority of produced water is injected into deep reservoirs located thousands of feet below freshwater sources. This type of injection provides the greatest protection for surface waters, soils, and vegetation from the salts contained in the produced water. For the next few minutes, we're going to take a close look at underground injection wells, including their design, operation, monitoring, and regulatory requirements. And we will also show you the levels of protection designed and monitored to permanently isolate injected produced water from underground sources of drinking water. To give you an idea of the amount of salt water produced in the United States every day, let's go now to our field reporter, Melinda Austin. Thank you, Quinn. It may surprise you, but a recent American Petroleum Institute study showed that on a national average, almost eight barrels of salt water are produced for every single barrel of crude oil. That means as much as 50 million barrels of water, typically very similar to seawater in composition, are removed from subsurface formations every day. Now you may be wondering how much water equals 50 million barrels. Well, to give you an idea, roughly one million barrels of water flow over these cliffs here at Niagara Falls every minute. So to see 50 million barrels, you would have to stay here for almost an hour. That's a lot of water. Think about it. During the production of oil and gas, this large amount of produced salt water, 50 million barrels, must be continuously used to increase oil production or be disposed of in an environmentally sound manner every day. Underground injection wells are required to handle this volume of produced water inherent in oil and gas operations. Oil and gas related injection wells have been used since the 1930s. And today, there are approximately 170,000 injection wells located in 31 states. Because these wells are constructed to return the produced water to the same or similar subsurface reservoirs from which it originated, these wells offer an environmentally protective solution for produced water disposal. Quinn? Thank you, Melinda. To help you visualize and appreciate the depth of an average injection well, we have constructed this scale model of a typical oil field injection project, representing a deep cross-section or core from the Earth's subsurface. The production equipment, well heads, and pumping units are on the surface, here at the top of the model. Two producing wells are located here and here, with an injection well drilled between them. The well bores penetrate through the various types of rock layers, finally reaching the producing formation located here at the bottom of the model. Now, since an average injection well is just under 5,000 feet deep, we have scaled our model so that one foot here equals 1,000 actual feet. And this makes an average 5,000 foot well about five feet deep. And as you can see, the well bore is only 
a few thousandths of an inch thick. And since our oil field is designed on a 40-acre spacing, this short distance between the two producing wells is in reality almost 2,000 feet. The relative size of this ordinary grain silo and barn should also give you a good idea of the scale of the model. Now, it looks like a long way down to the producing zone, but maybe a more familiar measurement will help you to put this in a better perspective. Imagine for a moment taking a football field and standing it on its end zone, 300 vertical feet. To illustrate this, I happen to have a football field made on the same scale as our model. Now, if they were stacked end zone to end zone, it would take over 16 football fields to reach from the injection formation all the way up to the surface. Well, now that you have an idea about where the water is injected, let's learn more about the origin of this produced salt water and why it's produced along with oil and gas. To understand the whole process, let's start at the beginning, millions of years ago when the rocks which hold the water and hydrocarbons were formed. Here's Melinda to tell us more. Current evidence indicates that most oil and gas deposits were formed millions of years ago when marine organisms and organic material were deposited on the floor of shallow seas surrounding the continental land masses. The carbon-rich deposits were then buried under layers of sediment. Most of the water produced with oil and gas originated from the water in these ancient seas, which was trapped when these layers of sediment, like this beach, were deposited on top of the organic material. Because these sedimentary rocks still contain the very same water from the ancient oceans in which they were originally deposited, the majority of today's produced water is salty. Reservoir rocks are sedimentary rocks exhibiting characteristics of both porosity and permeability. Higher porosity allows the rock to hold large volumes of water and, under the right conditions, oil and gas. However, the pore spaces within a typical reservoir rock are usually too small to be seen by the naked eye. Permeability refers to the degree to which the tiny pores of the rock are interconnected by microscopic flow channels. The greater the permeability, the more easily water or petroleum can flow through or move within the rock formation. Over millions of years, more sedimentary layers were deposited above the reservoir rock layers. Some layers, such as clays and shales, were compacted due to increased pressure and temperature, forming virtually impermeable layers. Under the right conditions, also over millions of years, the oil and gas formed from the organic deposits flowed or migrated upward into the more porous and permeable reservoir rocks. The gradually flowing oil and gas stopped their upward migration as they encountered the layers of low permeability rock which trapped the oil and gas, forming reservoirs. Quinn? When there is no barrier to the upward flow, the migrating oil will ultimately reach the surface. The La Brea tar pits in Southern California are a good example of hydrocarbons which have migrated from deep source rocks all the way to the surface. Gas bubbles are easily spotted as they continuously seep up to the surface. But what about fresh groundwater? Where does it come from? Most groundwater which is contained in the pores of shallower rocks is fresh because it originates from rainwater falling on the surface of the earth. However, as this water flows deeper and deeper below the surface, it dissolves more and more minerals from the rocks as it passes through them, gradually becoming more salty. This is why most fresh groundwater is taken from a relatively shallow zone near the surface. In any area of the United States, the local depth of fresh water is known and protected by state and federal regulators. We'll cover this in a little more detail later in the program. Next, let's look at the characteristics of a typical oil and gas bearing trap or reservoir located right about here. An oil reservoir is not a pool of liquid oil, but a porous and permeable rock, literally soaked, 
with gas, oil, and water. Almost all reservoirs have only water in the lower portion of the formation. The oil and gas, being lighter, reside along with small quantities of the original water in the upper portion of the formation. Oil wells are designed to produce oil from the portion of the reservoir which will produce the largest percentage of oil and the smallest percentage of water. However, as wells age, oil production decreases and water production increases. As the oil, gas, and water mixture leaves the reservoir up through the producing well bores, it enters the production system. Production facilities are designed to separate oil, gas, and water and then remove any rock particles that may be produced with the fluids. Let's look at the equipment used and follow the flow of fluids through a typical production facility. Melinda? As the well stream flows, ore is pumped from the bottom of the well to the surface. It first passes through the producing well head. From the wellhead, produced fluids are routed through flow lines to a production header where the fluids are mixed or commingled with water, gas, and oil from other wells. Next, the oil and water mixture passes through a series of separating and treating vessels to separate the oil, gas, and water and to remove solids and sediments. The majority of this separated produced water is utilized in secondary recovery projects to increase further oil production and the rest is disposed. As mentioned earlier, there are many options available for disposal. In a few cases, water can be discharged into salty surface waters such as bays or into fresh water streams when the produced water is relatively fresh. However, the most common alternative today is injection into deep underground reservoirs widely separated from fresh groundwater and surface water. Produced water injection, either for secondary recovery or disposal, may require filtering to remove sediments or other impurities, and also may have small amounts of chemicals added for corrosion control and prevention of scalar bacteria growth. After filtering, the produced water is routed to a pump, which increases the water pressure to injection specification. From the pump, the water is routed into the injection wellhead, where the injected water passes into the selected permeable formation thousands of feet below the Earth's surface. There are three types of reservoirs used for underground injection wells active producing reservoirs with secondary recovery water flood projects, depleted oil and gas reservoirs for disposal, and non-oil and gas bearing reservoirs also for disposal. And there are two types of injection, secondary recovery injection and injection for disposal. In certain oil and gas reservoirs as time passes, the driving pressure within the reservoir decreases making it more difficult to get oil out of the ground. Secondary recovery injection wells re-inject the produced water back into oil-bearing reservoirs in an effort to enhance oil recovery by increasing or maintaining the pressure within the reservoir or by sweeping the oil toward the producing wells. The majority of injection wells in the United States, more than 70%, are involved in secondary recovery or other similar enhanced recovery projects. This aerial view of a West Texas water flood project shows the pattern of injection wells used to re-inject into the reservoir. The injection wells shown here surround the producing wells shown here. In this way, Oil recovery is enhanced as the injected water pushes or sweeps more oil toward the producing wells. Disposal wells are designed to inject produced water into depleted oil reservoirs or non-oil bearing formations. Next, let's look at the typical design and construction features of injection wells. Injection wells are drilled to provide access from the surface to a formation thousands of feet below. These wells are drilled in much the same manner as oil and gas producing wells. 
In fact, many injection wells are converted producers. Injection wells have a section of steel pipe called the surface casing, which extends from the surface to a depth below the level of fresh water in the area. As I mentioned earlier, the depth of fresh water and the required depth of surface casing is determined by state regulators. After installation, the surface casing is securely cemented into place from the bottom of the casing all the way up to the surface. The surface casing and cement are designed to permanently separate and protect fresh water sources from the fluids inside the well. In addition, one section of steel pipe called the long string casing extends the entire length of the well from the surface down to the injection zone. Cement is pumped into the area between the borehole and the outer surface of the casing to a level required by the state, several hundred feet above the injection formation. The casing prevents collapse of the borehole. The cement isolates the injection zone from other formations up the borehole, thus preventing the migration of injected water up to fresh groundwater in the space between the long string casing and the borehole. After the cement has hardened or set up, the casing and cement are perforated across the desired injection zone. After the casing and cement have been perforated in the producing or injection zone, a string of steel tubing, usually lined with plastic, is run in the hole. A sealing device called a packer is set above the perforations to isolate the injected fluid from the long string casing. This system is designed to shield and protect the casing from injection pressure as well as corrosion caused by salty produced water. To summarize, there are several levels of protection built into every injection well. These include the surface casing and its cement, the long string casing and its cement, and the tubing and packer. This design effectively contains flow from the surface to the injection zone. A treated protective fluid is placed in the space located between the tubing and the long string casing called the annulus. This fluid prevents external corrosion of the tubing and packer and internal corrosion of the casing. The tubing and packer are designed to be replaceable components. If they fail, they are removed from the well and repaired and or replaced. The tubing and packer are then run back into the well and tested before the well is returned to operation. In some wells, the diameter of the casing is so small that the tubing size would restrict the amount of water to be injected. Therefore, these injection wells are completed without tubing and packer and are called tubingless completions. In these wells, the long string casing is normally cemented from the well's bottom to the surface. Safety precautions such as additional monitoring and testing are used with these wells because they lack a tubing and packer, one of the levels of drinking water protection common to other injection wells. Next, Melinda is going to tell us more about the control and monitoring of injection wells. Thanks, Quinn. The injection wellhead is equipped with gauges and valves used to monitor and control the flow of injected fluids. Typical gauges include a pressure gauge, which measures the tubing pressure of the injected water, and a pressure gauge, which measures the tubing to casing annulus pressure. A pressure regulator may be used to control injection pressure. A check valve is also used to prevent reversal of water flow into the surface equipment if the injection pump shuts down. Valves used to shut in the well typically include a tubing valve and a shutoff valve. Usually, a flow meter which measures the volume of injected fluid and a throttling valve which controls the volume of injected fluid are located here at the well. However, in this field, they're located at a central header. The throttle valves and flow meters 
located here at this central header, control and measure the fluid injected into each well in this field. To maintain proper operation of the injection well and protection of fresh water, the injection well must be carefully monitored. Data can be gathered at the wellhead indicating whether or not the injection well is operating correctly. The injection rate and pressure within the tubing must be tracked regularly. These records provide a good indication of the proper operation of the injection well. Any sudden change in the flow rate or pressure usually indicates a potential problem. Now, let's observe the pressure in the area between the tubing and the long string casing, called a tubing casing annulus. This pressure reading is the most important surface indicator of proper injection well operation. It's also the most effective method of determining the integrity of the tubing and packer. Remember, the tubing and packer provide the first level of freshwater protection. For wells injecting at a positive pressure, observing the annulus pressure will give the operator an indication of proper well operation. As a leak develops in the tubing, an increase in pressure appears on the tubing casing annulus pressure gauge, signaling to the operator that a problem has developed. For wells injecting with no pressure, observation of the fluid level in the tubing casing annulus will give the operator an indication of proper operation. Changes in this tubing casing annulus level may indicate leakage via the tubing, packer, or casing requiring further investigation. For wells without tubing and packer, temperature surveys and radioactive tracer surveys are run at periodic intervals to accurately check for any leaks. These temperature and radioactive tracer surveys accurately follow the movement of injected fluid deep within the earth. Engineers also use these surveys to determine if the injected fluid is entering the proper injection zone and also to make sure that the injected fluid is being uniformly distributed within the zone. Tracer tools are run into the well and connected to the surface via an electric cable. As data is collected deep within the well, it's immediately recorded by logging equipment on the surface. Radioactive tracers emit a radioactive material with a short half-life and are run into the well during injection. The tool uses a detector to accurately follow the movement of the radioactive material as it flows into the injected water. Temperature logs are run after the well has been turned off or shut in for a while. The temperature of the injected fluid is usually cooler than the deep injection zone. So, as it is injected, the cooler fluid reduces the temperature of the injection zone. The temperature tracer detects any leaks or areas around the well which have been cooled by the injection fluid. Thus, enabling the engineer to accurately interpret where the fluid is going as it leaves the well. The East Texas field is an example of an area warranting special provisions due to the use of injection wells with tubingless completions. Wells like this one, without tubing and packer. The operators of these wells were given permission to inject without tubing and packer because this field produces very high volumes of water and the wells are able to operate at low injection pressures. These East Texas wells also have additional monitoring and testing requirements. Injection rate and pressure monitoring of tubingless completion injection wells is critical because the added protection of the tubing and packer is not present. However, this higher risk is reduced by running annual temperature surveys and continuously monitoring the surface casing to long string casing annulus pressure. Quinn? Even if monitoring detects a hole or leak, it's highly improbable that contamination of fresh groundwater will occur. A number of independent events must occur simultaneously and remain undetected by the operator for injection water to reach an underground source of drinking water called a USDW. This means it's very difficult to contaminate fresh groundwater 
since three leaks or failures must occur simultaneously for this contamination to happen. First, a leak must occur in the tubing, allowing the pressurized injection fluid to enter the tubing long string casing annulus. At the same time, a second leak must develop somewhere in the long string casing, allowing the injected fluid to enter the borehole. Next, the fluid must move a long distance up the borehole, past permeable saltwater aquifers, through drilling mud and compacted rock layers, to reach the long string casing, surface casing annulus. Here, a third simultaneous leak or failure must occur in the surface casing and its cement. This third failure would allow the injected fluid finally to reach an underground source of drinking water. You can see that it's very unlikely for this type of drinking water contamination to occur. In fact, a recent study commissioned by the American Petroleum Institute has shown that for injection wells in oil fields where there is a possible or significant potential for corrosion related failures. The chances of drinking water contamination have been estimated through computer analysis and projections based on existing wells to be on the order of one failure per million well years where surface casings cover fresh water. The study has also shown that most long string casing leaks are at depths several thousand feet below the base of USDWs. In some areas of the country, formation waters above the zone of injection are particularly prone to cause external corrosion of the long string casing. Once these corrosive zones are recognized, completion practices are typically changed to cement the long string casing across all the corrosive formations. This isolates the casing from the corrosive zone. In areas where corrosion is known to be a problem, State regulators require cement coverage of specific corrosive zones. Corrosion can also be controlled by equipping the well with electrically charged or cathodic protection against corrosion. So to summarize the injection process, produced water is pumped down the injection well, isolated from underground sources of drinking water by the steel casing and cement which lines the well bore. The water then passes into the selected injection formation below impermeable rock layers. As an additional safeguard, the casing is tested routinely to ensure its mechanical integrity. Well, now we've covered the control of injected fluid as it passes through the injection wellhead and tubing and enters the injection zone. Are there any other potential pathways allowing saltwater migration from the injection zone into an underground source of drinking water? Well, to answer this question, let's look at the sequence of deposition in oil producing areas. We typically find several layers of impermeable shale deposited between the injection zone and the freshwater sands near the surface. These layers provide additional barriers to the migration of produced water. Fluid injection immediately raises the injection zone's pressure in a circular area around the well. This pressure is the greatest in the area directly surrounding the well, dropping dramatically as the distance from the well increases because there are more places for the water to go. The highly pressurized fluid is contained in the injection zone by the impermeable layers. But let's imagine for a moment that the confining impermeable layers above the formation are not there to restrict the upward movement of the pressurized injection fluid. As you can see, the pressurized fluid could rise to a level shown with the arrows depending on the amount of reservoir pressure in each location. The greatest pressure and therefore the highest movement is in the area closest to the well bore. Now by connecting the arrowheads, we can create a simple representation of this reservoir's pressure profile. The part of the pressure profile where the reservoir pressure is high enough to move the injection fluids from the injection zone all the way up into an underground source of drinking water is referred to by regulators 
as the zone of endangering influence. The size of this endangering zone can be calculated. Its size is influenced by the volume of water injected, the volume and permeability of the formation. The pressure differential between the injection formation and the drinking water formation and the difference in depth between the two formations. However, in reality, there is not only a confining layer, but many impermeable layers above the injection zone. For migration to occur, there must be some other avenue or conduit allowing fluid movement. For example, an improperly plugged abandoned well located here within the endangering zone creates the potential conduit for salt water to migrate into an underground freshwater source. However, even with an improperly plugged well in the area, other forces, in many cases naturally occurring, impede the vertical movement of injected fluid up the well and into freshwater sources. These forces include collapse of the well bore, drilling mud or cement in the borehole, the presence of downhole equipment such as packers left in place, and the existence of other permeable formations located between the injection zone and freshwater sources to divert the flow of fluid. And then we've evaluated this whole area around here. To obtain an injection series. permit, the zone of endangering influence surrounding a proposed injection that, well that must be thoroughly investigated oh, to ensure that all abandoned wells are properly plugged and to ensure that the injection formation is separated from fresh water sources by a confining layer free of known faults or fractures. Faults and fractures occur where the rocks yield to stresses within the Earth's crust. Regulations also require corrective action to be taken on improperly plugged and abandoned wells within the area of review. Today, over 70% of the injection wells in the United States are involved in secondary and enhanced recovery projects. Let's follow the changes in pressure over the life of a typical producing reservoir. To visualize the formation pressure, let's superimpose a typical pressure profile. The withdrawal of fluids, oil, gas, and water, during primary recovery operations lowered the formation pressure much below original condition. During secondary recovery operations, water injection raises reservoir pressure near the injection wells, pushing reservoir fluids towards low pressure areas created by the producing wells. And when the injection project stops, fluid continues to flow from the high pressure area around the injection well bore to the low pressure area away from the well. Therefore, the injection pressure dissipates quickly and the zone of endangering influence collapses. Most of the injection pressure within the formation dissipates within one year and after the producing wells are shut down, the reservoir's pressure approaches its original level. In the case of secondary recovery projects, the pressure in the formation generally equalizes at a level which is still below the formation's original pressure. In some disposal wells, produced water is injected into large formations not producing oil or gas. These formations have not had their pressure reduced by oil and gas production prior to the initiation of injection. When disposal stops, the pressure in the reservoir equalizes at a level which is overpressured, but usually still low enough to prevent any future groundwater contamination. Due to the compressibility of the rock and water, disposal formations can contain large amounts of water without raising the average pressure within the formation significantly. For example, injecting one million barrels of water into a smaller than average size non-oil and gas bearing formation, 100 feet thick with an area of 100 square miles, increases the pressure within the formation by only 17 pounds per square inch. So in summary, the potential for injected produced water to escape the injection zone and enter freshwater sands 
only exists during and shortly after the injection and only within an area close to the injection well. Well, next let's look at the regulations which cover underground injection in oil and gas operations. Melinda is in Washington, D.C. to tell us more. The regulation of underground injection has a long history. For example, state governments have regulated this activity for over 50 years. The most significant occurrence in this regulatory history was the passage of the Safe Drinking Water Act in 1974 by the United States Congress. This act instructed the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, to develop minimum standards for state regulatory programs to protect underground sources of drinking water from contamination by underground injection. The federal program centers on four primary areas the permitting of injection wells, the monitoring and reporting needs of injection wells, the mechanical integrity testing of injection wells, and the abandonment of injection wells. All new injection wells must be permitted. The permitting exercise evaluates the acceptability of the well's construction to protect underground sources of drinking water and also evaluates the acceptability of the injection formation to contain injection fluids. The permit sets operational limits for injection wells, such as maximum injection rates and pressures, and any other unique monitoring or testing requirements to ensure protection of USDWs. Replugging abandoned wells in the zone of endangering influence and other special requirements, such as a higher than normal reporting frequency, can be specified in the permit as warranted due to the geographical area or well construction characteristics. Monitoring and reporting of basic operating data is required to ensure wells are operating properly and abiding by conditions set in the permit authorizing injection. Items such as the monthly injection rate, tubing pressure, and tubing to casing annulus pressure are typically reported to the regulatory agencies. And all injection wells are required to run a mechanical integrity test on a periodic basis. The test must demonstrate that the well's construction is capable of controlling the injected fluid and containing it within the desired injection zone. Now, most wells completed with tubing and packer are tested by pressuring up the tubing casing annulus. This demonstrates that the well's tubing, packer, and long string casing do not leak. Cement records and logging tests are used to demonstrate adequate containment to prevent fluid from moving up the casing to wellbore annulus into a USDW. Quinn? Thank you, Melinda. To ensure the injection well does not present a threat to underground sources of drinking water after injection stops, the regulations require specific plugging practices to be followed. Basically, plugging practices require the injection zone and the underground sources of drinking water to be isolated in the well. Also, the well must not act as a conduit for contamination from the surface. As you can see, the reporting requirements for underground injection wells are complex and comprehensive. By working together, regulators and operators can protect underground sources of drinking water. I hope that in the past few minutes, this program has given you a better understanding of the history, design, operation, and regulatory requirements of underground injection wells. Through careful injection well design, operation, and monitoring, oil and gas operators and state and federal regulators strive to maintain the highest standards, serving the nation's energy needs while protecting the quality of underground sources of drinking water.